this afternoon. I should say tonight. Don't rush things, you know. So, <laughs> but uh, my name is David Mott. I am uh, I am uh, a, a member of the uh, Test African Cemetery Coalition. I've been working with Marsha and uh, other uh, coalition members for nine on two years now to uh, fight to reclaim not just the land that was the African uh, River Road community, but particularly the land that was the African River Road community burial ground and cemetery. And so what has been, I just want to uh, bring you a little bit up to date that this is, for people who may not know, uh, there was a, after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, there grew up a very vibrant community of African freed slave men and women, children, on River Road. And I say vibrant. It had farms, it had businesses, it had schools, it had churches, everything a community could want. Uh, and then once Reconstruction was ended abruptly uh, in 1877, and then particularly through the early part of the 20th century and into the 40s, 40s, this community, piece by piece, person by person, was destroyed. And people were dispersed, the diaspora. So, for the last several years, there has been a real struggle, a real fight, to win back land that was the cemetery, formal cemetery or cemetery, uh, and that is held by several organizations, some private, some public. And as a part of this struggle, a tremendous amount of history has been unearthed, you know. I mean, literally unearthed. Uh, and it is interesting to me, and I hope it will be interesting to you, to learn about this community that once was, that was a very vibrant part of American history. American history. And so I'm going to start off with a little quote from Howard Fast about this, because the, to put this into context, there were thousands of communities like this all over the country, free African men and women, who many times, in coalition with poor white folks in the South, but also in, in the North, that built real democratic communities. It was during Reconstruction that Africans, freed Africans, developed the first public education systems. It was them that did it. Because they valued education for the system for the children. There are a lot of innovations that we now take for granted in our democracy that they created. That they created. But we don't know that. And so I'm going to read to you from a book by Howard Fast called Freedom Road. And uh, Freedom Road is a story about Gideon Jackson freed slave uh, during Reconstruction who takes his freedom and runs with it and creates a, not just a new life for himself, but new life for many, many people, for many, many people. He becomes a congressman, which happened throughout the South. For the first time ever, Africans, African Americans became congressmen, state legislators, and he wrote constitutions in the process. And he recreated a community with poor whites called Carwa in this story. And they had to do it against terrible, terrible, overwhelming odds. The Klan was out and about, terrorism was out and about, and they did this. And this is the story of Gideon Jackson, his work, and it is a story of what happens when the deal was done, the Union troops were removed in 1877, and the Klan was resurgent and the terror was on. So I'm going to read to you from, from this afterword. Uh, after the whole story, I got through and oh, there's an afterword by Howard Fast. So I read it, and this afterword stuck with me as much as the story itself. So in the afterwards, Howard Fast asks, as you may ask, with justice, is there any truth to this tale, the tale of Gideon Jackson? And if there is, why has it not been told before? And he goes on to say, yes, this is a true story. This happened all over the country. Gideon Jackson was a composite of real, of real people, and Carwell uh, was a composite.
positive towns, thousands of them throughout the throughout the uh, throughout the nation. As to the second answer, uh, the answer to the second question, he says, why this has not been widely told before is not complicated. When the eight-year period of Negro and white freedom co and cooperation in the South was destroyed, it was destroyed completely. Not only were material things wiped out and people slain, but the very memory was expunged. Powerful forces did not hold it to be a good thing for the American people to know that once there had been such an experiment as Reconstruction, and that the experiment had worked, that the Negro had been given the right to exist in this nation as a free man and woman, man and woman who stood on equal ground with their neighbor, that they had been given the right to work out their own destiny in conjunction with the Southern poor whites, and that in an eight-year period of working out that des destiny, they had created a fine, a just, and a truly democratic civilization. And obviously, there are people that would prefer we don't remember that. But what is happening here is we are remembering, right? And literally, in some cases, it is being dug up and displayed on the floor of us, right? So I'm going to introduce for you, we have a few people that are still on the way, so we're going to rearrange the order of speakers a little bit. But I am first going to call on Tammy Hilburton. And uh, Tammy is an anthropologist, archaeologist, forensic archaeologist. There's a lot. There's a lot that Tammy is, but she is really going to talk to you about how this process of archaeology in these situations would take place. Okay. Thanks, David. David Mott, also with the Poor People's Campaign, works with Reverend Barber, does some really cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, he also plays the guitar, and so when we protest, we have David out there with the guitar. So <laughs> My name is Tammy Hilbert. I'm going to take this mask off. Is that okay? All right. I wasn't sure if I could. Just put the mic down. And y'all are going to hear it. I'm from the deep south. I won't try to hide it. I never have. Um, I'm from Arkansas originally. Um, oh, microphone. I'm yeah. shorty. Yeah, I'm shorty. All right. Now it's so loud. So I'll just stand back just a little bit. Um, my background is in archaeology, Egyptology. I worked on uh, narrative sequencing with the burial inclusions of Tadakamu. And uh, I also have degrees, uh, bachelor's degrees in French, music performance, some other stuff. So, but I got into this weird place with all this. I got into the world of cultural property crime. Because what I, what I became more interested in as I went along was that, OK, I can figure out all this stuff from King Tut's tomb because Howard Carter kept such good notes. It was excavated properly. That's a lovely thing. And when we have those notes, we can continue to study something for years and years and years. It's always there for us um, if it's archived properly. And that, that's a really good example of the best African Egyptian burial. You know, that's awesome. So, you know, I, I, I was like, you know, what's up with this problems with site looting? And archaeological site destruction became a passion of mine because, you know, when you can find out some information like that and you see it, and you really feel it. And you go, hold up, you know, they're messing stuff up all over the place. So I, I remember my first field school was in Mississippi, along the banks of the Mississippi River. It was hot as the hinges of hell. And uh, I dug and dug and dug. I was maybe a meter down in the ground, and I hadn't found anything. I was so, dis I was so disturbed. And I thought, well, this archaeology thing, this might not be my thing. So I found this little clay ball like the size of a marble. It was a foot from a clay jar. And I looked at it really closely. I think I was swimming from the heat. And there were fingerprints in this clay. And I was like, that's the ticket. That is how close to that individual person in antiquity that we can get. Now, can you imagine what we can do with human remains? I mean, really. And in Bethesda, not, what is it, 7.2 miles down the road, they're digging up bones and taking them to the landfill. That's messed up. Um, we did a, an archaeological evidentiary photography team in 2020. We took 30,000 plus photos, um, zoom photography, area shots. We recorded the destruction 
of a part of the cemetery and the previous um, habitation area of the black residents on River Road. And it was intense. It was really intense. You'll see some pictures in the catalog. Um, the only the only things the only items of of personal like personal items that we were able to capture that were photography for those three months were dress shoes and dress slippers. Now, that's usually the kind of thing somebody's buried in. We also have we caught a, we we have one good shot that Nick took. My partner, Chef Nick Gregory, is on the end. He'll talk a little bit about the photography. But uh, we got one shot of uh, what most likely is part of a, a coffin lid. And we know that in the 60s, the, uh, the cemetery was bulldozed. They, they, they took all the headstones away. They took all the landmarks away. I, it's, there's more information about uh, the stratigraphy of white supremacy in the exhibit catalog. And I can talk with y'all about that afterwards if you want. But it's been a trip. I can't believe it. We fought. We've been fighting tooth and nail. We took it to the state historic preservation officer. We took it to the state's attorney. We, we have forensically verified digital photographs, verified by teams in New York and London. The state's attorney wouldn't take it. We, we were able to prove there were funerary objects on that site and that they were carting them out to landfill. We got no love from the state historic preservation officer or from the state's attorney, from the county executive, Mark Everidge. It's a mess. What really disturbs me the most, I came out here to work for Interpol Washington uh, as a cultural property crime manager. I'm not at Interpol anymore, but we make elaborate bilateral treaties with other nations, such as China. If their stuff comes here and it gets put on the auction block at Sotheby's or Christie's, Law enforcement is going to get it and take it back, give it back to China. We're going to have a big repatriation ceremony. It's going to be a big thing. That's great, but not seven miles down the road, we can't do right by a black cemetery. Now, that's messed up to me. So I decided to get involved when my buddy, Dr. Yvette Yeboah Butler, invited me on June 8, 2020. So that's what I've been doing with the Cemetery Coalition. So if you have any other questions, I, I, I was. I was ill with COVID earlier this month, this past month. I'm not infectious now, hallelujah, but I'm a little whack because of that. So sorry if I sound funny. But if I can if I can answer any additional questions or you have things that you want to understand about how this happens right down the road, the diagram that I gave you kind of shows how these it's almost like a RICO situation. You know, this is organized crime. Um, the descendant community has no say so. In the, in, these, in the burials of their ancestors. And that's really messed up. Um, there's a lot of details. It's a huge case. It's one of many cases in the United States involving historic African American cemeteries and burial grounds. This place started out as a slave body dumping site. Then it evolved into a formal cemetery. So this, this site goes back to the beginning. So you can kind of figure that out for yourself. But, there are people here way more qualified than me to talk about that stuff. So thank you very much for listening. And if I can answer your questions, let me know. Thank you, Tammy. So uh, yes, this is, uh, and, and Tammy, Tammy mentioned that, that this, what we were talking about, if you go to River Road now, you will see a construction site to build the fourth storage facility on that intersection. And that is where the burial ground was, right? In some of the formal cemetery of this community. But the burial ground, as Marsha will talk to you in a bit, was where slaves were thrown when they died. That's what happened. And in this community, when not this community, but in these uh, uh, the, the confluence of three major plantations at that intersection and then some minor ones. They grew tobacco. Tobacco, if you just keep growing, it will ruin the land. You can't grow much at some point. It just sucks the nutrients out. So they couldn't grow. By the mid-1840s, they couldn't grow any tobacco. It was too late to switch to cotton. So what are they going to do to make money? And they decided what they were going to do was breed slaves. And that's what they did. The international slave trade had been outlawed. Right? Even in the United States, they outlawed that. So now, how were slaves to be replaced when 
they died, and they grew them, they bred them, and that's what happened. And so when young girls, Marshall will explain in a bit, as young girls die in childbearing, or their child dies uh, in childbearing, they were thrown them. And this is what has been dug up that Tammy talks about. Okay. Next, we want to hear, and, and I think this will be very interesting. Karen Wilson, I'm a chefu, and uh, she is going to talk about the golden age of Africa. And why is that important? It is important because that is where the people who became slaves here were from. And they weren't sitting on a beach doing nothing when they were picked up. They weren't loitering. They were part of vibrant, vibrant civilizations in Africa at the time. And they also were able, and they were not able, they were forced to learn their skills, and they were extremely skilled. Many. You know, from metalworking to agriculture and back. So Karen is going to talk a little, uh, about this, the golden age of Africa, set the pay the tone for who was brought here, what did they leave behind, and what did they learn. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'm so grateful to be here with you this afternoon. Um, although, well, let me just start. There is a, an amazing image as you enter the exhibit of a man, a black man, dressed in, um, in the most um, uh, elegant European attire uh, appropriate for the Portuguese court. His name is Don Miguel de Castro. You'll find that uh, when you begin to look at 16th century and 17th century history in Central Africa, that the Portuguese had made inroads there. First, and you know, this is the playbook that is played out all over the world, really. First, they come as um, missionaries, as people um, purporting to represent Christianity. Although all loving and all loving Jesus would never have allowed his name to be used in that way or anything having to do with it to be used in that way. However, they come saying that they are Christian and bringing this uh, wonderful, loving Christian um, tradition. And then when people begin to take it, as often is the case, particularly people of a certain class, upper class people we would call them, begin to take this practice, or whatever it is that the Westerners are offering, they begin to take this, then um, they find that they are opening themselves for manipulation, for um, uh, war, for captivity because although the people who come in first with this may be of peace of mind, those who come after them uh, are not. And we have to remember, just as we remember, I'm going to be talking about the golden age of Africa, we need to also remember that in the history of the world, this period, the 16th and 17th centuries, are what um, some of our uh, history texts call the new monarchs in Europe. What they mean is they were monarchs in name, but they had no money. They had no money and they were um, running out of what they did have. The resources they had were getting very scarce. And so they, um, instead of tribute, as some of the older empires did, they would subjugate places and have tribute brought to them, they allied themselves with companies. The Royal Dutch uh, Company, the Royal East India Company, the Royal, is it Royal British Company. What those companies are is they are proto-capitalist entities. 
And those early capitalist entities began to call the shots for the European monarchs because they were the ones with the money. So that's what's going on in Europe. They're trying to find and claw their way up out of, um, out of what we call a medieval, out of the dark ages, and find themselves a place in the world. So the world had all of these incredible riches, but nobody wanted their wool. So now we come and look at Africa. What, 10 million square miles of absolute amaze, amazing um, strength and beauty, not only in its physical, in her physical attributes, but also in her intellectual and cultural treasures. So we have in Africa a group, uh, groups, groups, nations. We have been taught uh, that tribe is a, a dirty word um, because I don't even quite know why now. And I've been studying history now 30, 40 years. I'm still not clear why tribe is a bad word. In any case, so because of the way we've been marketed our history, we call them nations. Nations that fill this 10 million square miles and have discovered ways to deal with the many, many, many different kinds of, of uh, geography and, that, that they were presented to traverse rivers that are un unnumbered, unknown, unknown in number, at least not by me, to um, find themselves, you go 50 miles and there's another language. Well, you learn to learn languages pretty quickly um, with tremendous uh, mineral and uh, gem deposits all over the place, with salt, which was one of the most precious things that the world had. Um, and pepper, which at one time was very difficult to find. We have um, in, the, in the Niger Delta a tremendous um, tradition of the cultivation of foodstuffs. It can be a breadbasket for the world. So then how is it that Africa in now is hungry? Everyone takes from mother, but no one gives. And so, <clears throat> The people who came to River Road came, I would tell, I would say, as um, Dr. Michael Blakey, Blakey directed us, came from Congo and they came from Senegambia, from Senegal and Gambia region. Um, we know that in a number of ways. We know that um, women in Congo were much, could be, let me just say, could be highly respected, strong leaders, uh, in some cases military leaders, in some cases political and economic leaders. So we see Queen, Queen Nzinga, who has taken in um, Congo, Ndongo and Matamba, in Ndongo and Matamba. She is in Central Africa. She is, um, during the Portuguese approach to her kingdom, to her queen, though. and she doesn't like what they're doing with her people, so she writes to her sister queen and says, would you please stop taking my people? She, um, she converted to Christianity, and that kept the people, they kept them off her tail for two years, and then they kept coming. Well, um, also in West Central Africa, there is um, Doña Beatriz Kimpavita, who is also a high, a person of high stature, who has become Christian, but she has brought with her her Nganga Marimba uh, training. So she is responsible for the moral and spiritual well-being of the people in her kingdom. And so she takes these ideas and brings them along with Christianity to create a an African Christian re revolution, reformation, that had nothing to do with Martin Luther in Europe, and everything to do with African spirituality, which we are taught is so full of fetish and devilishness. I would say no. 
So the um, Kimpa Vida, we hear about Joan of Arc. Kimpa Vida led a revolution that um, found with ideas that found their way into the Haitian Revolution and into the Stono Rebellion that took place in South Carolina. Ideas. The people who came from West Africa brought with them ideas. They brought with them uh, ways of agriculture that Europeans had no knowledge of. Um, for instance, the cultivation of rice. Europeans had heard about rice, Chinese had rice, but they knew nothing about how to cultivate it. Africans had been growing rice in the Niger Delta, etc., for generations, for hundreds of years. And so in South Carolina for many years, the way you planted rice was you put your toe in the ground, make a hole, drop a seed in, and cover it with your heel. You move to the next spot, stick your toe in the ground, drop a seed in, and cover it with your heel. That rice plant, that rice cultivation, gave South Carolina an incredible crop with all kinds of money flowing from it. None of it, not to the Africans and not to their descendants, has flown in that direction. When we talk about reparation, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. We're not talking about who was on the ball plantation in 1830. We're talking about the the, the wealth that was developed by Africans for Europeans over generations that is now flowing into European American communities, but none of those are flowing into African communities. And so Africa, which is the mother of all, and her descendants who, that have taken all of this amazing knowledge all over the world are being left to beg. And that's wrong. So, we have in Africa, as you will see in our catalog, three of the earliest um, universities in the world that attracted attention and students from all over their known world at the time. We have ophthalmology. We have science mathematics. For instance, African fractals. You can go and look them up. It's a way of understanding the, the, the natural world and you see this understanding blossoming in the layout of African communities, traditional communities. Um, so the people on River Road brought with them a realization when they hit these shores, and the realization went deep into the ground. We say that Congo goes deep into the ground and comes up in our diaspora fruit. So on River Road we have two women, two groups of women that we should be looking at. One of them is Charlotte Gray. Charlotte, well, well let me tell you about the River Sisters. The River Sisters were two sisters who, had, who were very wealthy, had wonderful um, um, property, and were much respected in ways that are very unusual for European American women to be respected. That is not the way the community worked. And we also have Charlotte Gray, who had so much community and respect and um, influence that the property that she owned was called Grayville. That is a Congo issue. We'll also find that this community is called Crow Hill. Toby Town, which is down the road a piece, a Toby is a lucky charm. It's something that that brings luck and good goodwill and that sort of thing. Um, so the people of Toby Town were acknowledging that their, their situation was going to be a good one. And they were, I'm sure, established after 1865 and the uh, emancipation through the Civil War in which Africans fully participated here. But Crow Hill is something else again. Crow, I contend, just as Jim Crow, which was an African, uh, African, New World African um, term, comes from Jan Crow. Melville Hurst Christophus tells us that this was in use in Saramanca in French Guiana. Jan Crow. Jan Crow is buzzard. Jan Crow 
is another way to say buzzard. And we know buzzard is an animal that has to do with death. And so all around the Caribbean and in, on, in the United States, what became the United States, Jim Crow became the name of a dance and a song. See, it's so interesting that there is no creativity in white supremacy. They play the same tune over and over and over again. They can't even think of a new name for what they did to us. So they took our name, Jim Crow, to name what they were going to do to us. Can you, can you get to that? And so uh, Crow Hill comes out of a Senegambian use of language. A crow is a big black bird, and you know we're all about metaphor, just as the buzzard is a big black bird. And the crow is also a carrion bird. And it is my feeling that this use of crow reflects Senegambia on River Road because they are witnessing and referencing Moses, a place of death on Crow Hill. So, thank you so much for coming, and we look so much forward to seeing you in the exhibit of Sam.
one book almost a year at this point. Um, I think we're already thinking about our third book. But there is so much information about this community that needs to be made public. Um, and we're just starting to look for them. So I'd like to, um, my discussion is going to really evolve around the three quotes that I begin my article. Um, it should be our article. Um, with, and my co-writer for this article was Dr. Timothy Willard. And the name of the article in the book, and you'll find um, this article, is Human Trafficking, Sexual Brutality Against African Women and Forced Reproduction, Death as a Way of Life. So you've heard a little bit about our life when we were in Africa, the kind of nation states we had built, the technologies, the universities, the first three universities on earth were, were created, established in Africa. Um, the uh, cataract surgery, which Africa had become so famous for, um, the Europeans who travel into Africa to receive this kind of surgery, the mathematics, the science, all of this was going on. And we term it in our book, The Golden Age of Africa. Um, but what happens? What happened to the people once they got here? What happened to the little girls once they got here? to River Road. And so I want to focus on that topic for a second. And um, uh, David, just let me know in five minutes. Okay. Okay, so I start off this article with three quotes. Um, the first quote, a child raised every two years is of more profit than the crop of the best laboring man. In this, as in all cases, Providence has made our duties and our interests coincide perfectly. With respect, therefore, to our women and their children, I must pray you to inculcate upon the overseer that it is not their labor, but their increase, which is the first consideration with us. And that's President Thomas Jefferson. So, so Jefferson uses a biblical-like reference to glorify and celebrate that providence or God, or God, that or the providence or what he considers that God had made, quote, unquote, our duties and our interests coincide perfectly. So what Jefferson is referring to is the institution of sexual breeding, or what BACC our organization calls sexual barbarism. Of African girls and women, they're brought on fathomable rates of death as high as 90% in some areas of the country and unspeakable suffering to children. Jefferson, in fact, bragged to George Washington that the birth of black children was increasing Virginia's capital stock by 4% annually. Another quote that we start this article with. Yet we do know that these African American slaves died by thousands. One study, for example, found that the mortality rate of black children on the South Carolina and Georgia <coughs> coastal rice plantations, again, that Dr. Karen talked about, was astonishingly high. Nearly 90% of all children died before they reached the age of 16. Even on more interior cotton plantations, it's likely that nearly one out of every three slave children died before adulthood. Death was certainly a way of life for African American slaves, and they had ample opportunities to make the trip from slave settlement to cemetery for their friends and family. This quote is actually taken from the BACC legal brief, as you may know, we just won two historic lawsuits. And if you read um, the lawsuits, which are absolutely brilliant, you will find the historic reference to this. Um, and it's taken from the article entitled History of African American Cemeteries. All of this is in the book that you can get from outside. And last, but certainly not least, um, a quote. She died about three hours after I was born. They made my mom work too hard. That was Edward DeVoe, who was the formerly, um, what we would call, uh, enslaved man. Um, I tend not to use words like slave or enslaved. Um, 
I think, um, you know, what we're really looking at are warriors. We're looking at people who fought from the time they woke up in the morning until the time they went to bed at night. Um, the fact that they were captured is, is an issue of war, quite frankly. So I'm really comfortable with calling my ancestors warriors. Um, but if there's one point uh, that I'd like for you to take away from this short uh, lecture um, is that the system that Europeans, our enemies, um, called slavery was actually a war against Africa's children. And then perhaps, and perhaps Africa's girls. I know there's so much that we don't know about the treatment of African boys and men during this period that I really, I really hesitate to say that it was that, that it was focused only on girls. I think the research is probably going to show that boys and men uh, were also the target of this kind of barbarism. Um, but who are the children that Jefferson is referring to that God has made our duties and our interests coincide with? I just wanted to give you a sense of each of the what, what a typical, what we call in BACC, European historians like to call them plantations because for the European point of view, what was being planted was the most important thing happening in that space. But from a bottom-up perspective, from an African perspective, what was going on in that space was really death. And so we actually call them death camps. We don't call them uh, plantations. And so if you look at John Council, and he's been referred to a couple of times now, because that's where Macedonia Baptist Church is located, the councilman death camp area. Um, so who was on there? Just, just going to give you a short idea of who was there. Uh, so there are no names, of course, because our ancestors have, you know, are now not being called by names, are being used, called by other, uh, in other ways. One 21-year-old male, one 14-year-old male, one 5-year-old male, one 14-year-old female, one 12-year-old female, one 5-year-old female, one 14-year-old female, one 4-year-old female, one 3-year-old female. Does that sound like a tobacco operation to you? Does that sound like a place where, where people are harvesting tobacco? So tobacco plants commonly grow up to four to six feet tall, depending on the species. And some grow as tall as 15 feet. I've just read you, I've just read you what a typical plantation or death camp look like on River Road. I'm just gonna take one second and say, when you go upstairs again, you're going to see a, um, a display, um, a display area you're going to see a white chenille dress. It's a slip that the little girls used to wear under the road. They didn't have underwear, not even in the winter time. And they didn't have shoes to a large extent. Um, and they were five years old when they started being rented out to various homesteads in this area. They were literally being rented out at five years old on the weekends. And you're going to see the white dress they wore. And I want you to really think about girls when you think about River Road, because it's one of the very distinct properties of this area, is that they were so engaged in corporate sexual violence against little girls, not the, um, the, the Hollywood notion of what was happening on, on, in these areas. But what was really happening in these areas was that children were being murdered. speakers try and connect some, some dots. It is very, very clear that the historical evidence is that this was, uh, you know, the, the, the death camps, as Marsha calls them, were there. There are lists of people who were in those death camps who were forced labor, you know, in terms of work and in terms of birth. A lot of this fight in the current era 
is about what is there. County officials have said there was no cemetery. Therefore, it was okay to build a storage facility. Or there was no cemetery. It's okay to build a parking, uh, an apartment complex and pave over that ground with the parking lot. And a lot of what we, what we really, Marsha, and the, the cemetery coalition has done, is done from a great distance because they can't, they're not allowed onto the property, right? From a great distance to begin to document that, both through historical records and photographs. Photographs of what's being dug up, bones. We've seen bones dug. Do we know the humans? No. But the, where humans were buried, you know, well, I mean, really, right? And so, uh, funerary objects, which Tammy talked about, uh, funerary objects that very commonly were buried with people after the center. So I want to uh, bring up two people. First, Nicholas Gregory, who has worked with Tammy, is Tammy's partner, Chef Gregory, and uh, it's a very good book. Uh, and he's going to talk about the photographic, what they did in photographic evidence to begin to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is what we're dealing with. Um, 
there was a number of times where a car or a truck would drive by with a uh, you know Proud Boy sticker or an Oath Keeper sticker or a Three Percenter sticker on the back of it and yell, yelling obscenities at us. So I try to uh, you know zoom in on their license plate number in case they came back and tried to cause more trouble. Um, we also were uh, photographing the police and security guards that were ever present on the site. Um, they, uh, just to keep them honest, <laughs> uh, there was a, a couple of times where some uh, pieces of heavy machinery were trying to get past the protesters into the site, that they were blocking them with their bodies. And uh, one time where they tried to um, actually run over Dr. Coleman on the bio with the uh, cement mixer, um, we have a photograph of that as well. Um,
right? And so, uh, you know, and then we go to the state's attorney, and he says, they didn't find anything. No, I mean, that's what we're told. I've had conversations with the state, but we didn't find anything. You know, and other officials in Montgomery County, there was nothing found. That's not true. That's obviously not true. I want to introduce Gail Reba. Gail is a photographer, but much, much more. She is a big part of what is above us here in, in the in the uh, display, the the uh, uh, the yeah, I, that's what word I, I would say, a display of the history of, of River Road from Africa to River Road, and then to what life was like for people who were enslaved and forced to work on River Road. Gail. It does coincide with 
my other artwork that I do that's less covering the uh, cultural history of very specific sites. And when I do this in the Washington area, there's almost always a racial aspect to the uh, history of the different sites. And the River Road is like, it's less than a mile away from here. Yes, it's very close. Here's my favorite. <laughs> In uh, 2020, I think it was 2020, September 2020, time flies during COVID, um, the, uh, we, we were visited by Reverend William Barber II for a rally at the Macedonia Baptist Church. He spoke to us by way of Zoom. Uh, I ended up, and in, in, you can see, uh, it, he is, I translated, transcribed, uh, sometimes I felt like I was translating. Uh -huh. uh, uh, translated his speech, and it's in this book, which again is on sale out, out front. But I want to read, before I introduce our last speaker, who I think is really, really important, I want to read a little bit about what he talked about to again close the circle a bit. And he talked about this. Over the course of American history, approximately 11 million acres of black people's land was lost and stolen. That's, this is about land theft, land theft, land theft, and it was stolen through fraud, deception, outright political trickery. Much of this land has happened, in, much of this land theft has happened in the last 50 years. Latino people, and I've got to kick out of this, although it's pretty hard. Latino people, we stole whole two states from them, from Mexican people. We stole Texas, Arizona, now New Mexico. And the reason we stole Texas is that the Texans wanted to keep their slaves poor white folks had their land stolen. Now that we have seen, going back to this article, he's quoting a New York Times article, is that if we had not had 11 million acres of black people's land stolen, these properties could have provided the foundation of black wealth building in the Jim, post Jim Crow era of America. Instead, you get people in slavery for 250 years, Jim Crow for 100 years. You never gave the 40 acres in a mule. And then on top of that, you steal the land they do have, and other pe make, people make money off it. And then he goes on to talk about this. Thurgood Marshall said this about land. He said he described the manipulation of tax delinquency laws by white officials as the practice and custom of depriving Negroes of their property through subterfuge. There has been some subterfuge in this taking of property at the Moses African Cemetery that you were fighting for, he says. The Moses African Cemetery was a grave site stolen because of greed, Barbara said. Because of greed. And we have to ask all these hard questions. When you think about what you will do with the property when you get it, he says to us. Yes, the community center. But if the people that stole it thought about economic development, I would humbly suggest that you think about that too. Calculate that money because somebody has made a whole lot of money, got a whole lot of dollars, and a whole lot of taxes on the graves of your ancestors. And you ought to get back more than just the graves. You ought to get back more than just the land. You ought to get back more than just the sentimental value because your people's lives and the land they fought for, it was worth so much more. And if it wasn't, they would never have stolen. We are dealing with land theft. That is the issue. Harvey Matthews, who was our next and last speaker, the best for last, he was born in this community. He was raised in the community. He played in the graveyard. He knows the truth. And so he is going to talk to you about his remembrances, his observations about the African River Road community. Good afternoon, everyone that's here. It does me joy to see the faces that I haven't seen before, faces that did not come up in my community. But I do have to take time up and thanks to the folks who have helped us doing our struggle there on River Road with the Moses Center. And I've been asking and asking and asking, where have you gone? I haven't seen you, Rick. 
out there from days you already know I was there with you all looking for them afar. There's a lot of things that I've seen that didn't have photos of that you all had photos of. And you all did a hell of a lot of job doing that. And on behalf of the church, I want to thank you all very much for your pitching with us and giving us a helping hand. Sister Lucy, you know how I feel about you. I'm going to love, love, love. <laughs> Stood on both sides and held demonstrations, and we had cried together, sung together, and with y'all's help, we all kept the trip. Groups in mass. But I could say I stand here this evening on the behalf of my family and some of the last residents of River Road. And right now, living, it's only seven, seven of us left on the whole black community. They are on the road. Uh, and we, we are fading to the, to the wayside of the God be your glory. To continue to keep us on. They are coming, did a great job in helping us and the ones who have helped us. But on River Road, from my standpoint, I was born and raised there. I was born in Suburban Hospital in 1944. I was the second black born in Suburban Hospital the wing of the hospital that was put there. So blacks could have somewhere to go and have their children in a decent part of the structure. And that wing of that suburb hospital, you know it or not, look in the history for every other story is told, was built on the money that was donated when the National Baptist Church built that wing there in the suburb hospital. Struggled there, struggled. And I'm cut down to the cemetery. I think about six years ago, uh, the marshal invited me to a meeting with the county council of Montgomery County. And while that meeting was being carried on, they just kept speaking and using the word alleged, 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 that there was a cemetery there or there wasn't a cemetery there. Uh, I found it got them so they get my attention so I could testify. Who I testify moment at that time. I told them that it was a cemetery there in 52, 53, 54, those years of time. Us on the way to school, we used to pass through the cemetery there between West Bar and River Road. And also we came from school. We didn't have playgrounds like you see all over the city now for people to go and play and have recreation. The cemetery was really our recreation spot where we used to go play. So I saw you all know the game of hide and go seek, and that's what we played. Uh, we ran behind those gray markers, hid behind those gray markers, used that gray markers for our face. Who else was in charge of trying to find another one and try to beat them back to that face? That's how that game accumulated itself. But in the later years, and get Montgomery County to understand, it may have took us about three years or six years that we've been struggling now to convince them that there was a cemetery there. Uh, even the history show of grave markers being there, people being buried there, uh, they translated some bodies from Reno Road. Tended town area and place moved them to the cemetery there at Moses. Someone gave me knowledge of that. Some that's us, us, some of the from East Road, for you not to know that knowledge. And when I was going to public schools in Montgomery County, and I think closed our school in 1954, which was all black school. So our grades went in that school from the first to the eighth grade. And we had no three room schoolhouse there on the road. Well, you see that big great town if you know the area over there. That town sits right in the center of where the schoolhouse was located. So when they passed segregation integration in 54, I was seen in my education. And someone said elementary school. It's up on Wisconsin and Dawson Avenue. And then we went there. Some of us went to Green Acres and Wood Acres to continue that education. Somerset Elementary School, 
I went to Western Union High School down on Pass Avenue at West Park Avenue. And but there, the good old telling son, these these things we call common term, then the Chevy Chase High School to attend the education there at the My friends, just like everybody else on River Road, uh, now was stolen on the bellows and whatnot. And my grandfather had almost going to have to give his property away and during that time. But we couldn't get no triple rights things to stand up for us. And I don't know if you know anything about Watts Suburban Sanitary Commission. But they were in a collusive dress on in the county to tell us that we didn't have running water, that you had to leave your, leave your home and sell your home because you didn't have running water. So what happened, I was fortunate because I live like you said, a rock stove from Kenwood, you know the Kenwood area. Uh, and being a black guy on the road, uh, our family home was the closest black living part of the River Road community to Kenwood. And my plan and recreation at that time was kind of developed because I was a very, very good athlete. And I played with all the white kids there in Kenwood. Chevy Chase, Springfield, and all, all those areas. And it's funny that I understand here today that this foundation, and this is where I learned to swim, right here at American University, because down on River Road, we had day camp. And our day camp was sponsored by the Westmoreland Baptist Church. And us blacks down on River Road, that's, we came out of the canal and, and out of the creeks down on Tom and come to a safe area where we can learn to swim and have camp. Like all the other kids, the white kids that I went to school with had. And that's how we travel, that's how we indulge and fight this thing of the cemetery. It gets very emotional for me. But I can tell you the stories, you know how how the living conditions on River Road. They was lovely as, as, as black folks and as a community of blacks. Plenty of love. Everybody shared what they had. You raised tomatoes, you got tomatoes, you slaughtered hogs, you got something unique, and we went around that. But basically, I came up, what you might want to say, on a farm on River Road. Mm -hmm. I come up on a farm. We had horses, we had cattle, and goats, and all that. And my dad, Train beetle dogs, which is a big conversation in the, week, in the news the last couple of weeks, of how to hunt. And white men used to come to River Road and, have, and bring all the food, raw meat, stuff for the dogs. And my dad trained the dogs how to hunt. And I had, my dad had pigeons where you could take a van on a pigeon leg, put a van in the nest on it, and put a coop in, in Tober Town or Tober Road. That pigeon would go down, and somebody else would regroup it better. And, and in the evening time, on dust dark, those pigeons would come back to where my dad had trained them to come in the coop, and he'd take the van off the leg and get some message to somebody else at, at, at Sunday at, 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 at that time. You know? And we had three horses, pretty much. My brother and my sister, number one, they rode horses and rode them well. We were one of the few black families down the road that had things of horses and animals that they had things to care for. So it wasn't a poor family then. And eventually, the people, the kids I went to school with, their parents and their grandparents were able to provide my grandfather, cap off their water line, and bring running water into our house down the road. And we was one of the families that. They had running water that watched the bird that paid us out and said that we didn't have it. That why, that's why we had to move up. But they found all the trickeration ways to get my granddad earlier land in the old. Right today, if you know anything about the earlier River Road over there, right where the whole food sets, Corn River Road, all the way back to North Slam, come up, back around the railroad track. Yeah. My grandfather owned it, where those two gas stations sat down right there. With good uh, space. Storage is you know, on that was their property. They own they own to the share, the recreation, white man's generation or not. 
we had the faith of some that they didn't have us. And we got the railroad in 1958, moved to the DCR. Uh, we have my education at the local high school, you know, Christmas Street, 13th Street. What is there to go to be at home at night? What is there to be fearful when you went to bed? He was gonna wake up to the breaking of a new day the next day. I want to have to tell you the story about roots, different stories that had come up and they had shown me that I lived at Elm River Road. I know what it is to be beat. See my grandfather, my dad, my mom, them, go from the front room to the back room to the front yard and get the living hell beat out of them. Go to plant them with their sticks and their clubs and whatnot, and I lived that. And then they had an area of time that they used to call blackout. And what blackout really meant was when they came through, and their buggers and their old trucks and their wagons and things, and they declared blackout. If you niggas know what blackout means, we're going to teach you what it means. That means get the hell in your house, film yourself. In the middle of one of your floors, whichever room you choose to do that. You don't want a light on in there, no giggling and sniffing, no talking in there, and everything goes off until we come back and it clear all clear. Then you can go back and consume the radio, TV, socialize yourself. But deep, deep, see the bird. I'm almost 80 years old now, but I lived that for myself. And I took them for And I always did it still today. Prepare my mama cry in the midnight hour, whichever hour that was the dark. Not to kill my father. Not to kill my grandfather. Have mercy on me. Lord, please have mercy. Have mercy. And I lived that. And I grew up with that. And, and, I, and I ain't ashamed to tell you. I'm telling you, tell, 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 tell the grandkids. Granted, lived some that time. And I went through some. I went through some of them beatings, clubs, and whatnot. Yeah. And, and I said it then. But should I hate the white man? Should I hate white folks? And I'm going to tell you, I said it then. It took me a long, long time to accept that because I had all white friends throughout the county. Yeah. I played sports throughout the county. I set records at the high schools and things all around. You know, without cut, without going to school. So I would love by I played ball by But I can remember when we won a ball game and went on with Wisconsin Avenue. Back then they had a dark drug, drug family. And the team would go in and film themselves at the counter. Get a burger and a coat because we had won the game. The man in the store would come up and say, he can't stay here. He has to go outside. He has to come around to the side door to get his burger and his soul. He cannot live in I had a strong place of coach that I grew to love very much with the white man. And he said, it's hard to can't live in here. No, no, no. We all grew up. We did not live in here. Same way with the little tavern back in the day. Instead of always talking about the railroad track. You know, same way with going in there and getting a burger and a coat. Same thing with limits. He cannot eat him. He take that black boy around the back. And he gets his through the side window in the alleyway. And that's where he would be And he cannot come here and sit at, sit at the counter. Right on Wisconsin, West Stanley, where the hot shop used to be years ago. It was the same thing. Blacks put the orders in on the inside. When outside, we see the soul, the food through the sliding door on outside. And you see, that's how we were raised. We thought all God and they And that really rooted into the church is what changed me. How we have life for the white man at that time. So the mercy of the Lord, the Lord. And I've been a member of the National Baptist Church there, the little church of Central Boy here. 51 years. Of my life I've been there and I'm still there today. Subscribe, 
I'm trying to help others. Say it so. I had a great pastor, Reverend Bob, the Marshall. They've been a great strength in our church since they came there to join with us. He had become the pastor. I thought all Bob would do that with my older mom and daddy. I might say more than that. You all might want to hear what you know. I still stand. But I'm not afraid. No, I say I should not be afraid of anything. It's created made by him. I should not be afraid of it. I've had my little threats on the Eagle of the Ocean to be doing it, going down there, fighting these people, going to these courthouses, rock wheel, hell, and all that. But I build up. Build up, I say, on the strength in the back of my great grandfather, my grandfather. In the little story that I'm going to take my seat, it's about the White House. The bomb shelter in the White House was built by the black men of River Road back in the day. They used to bring the train to River Road, stop at the crossing right there by McDonald's, and pick up the black men and carry them down to Georgetown. They would take that little boat down to the White House and build the bomb shelters. And the man that would pop the name in the history of River Road down was the William Clipper. He used to be the man who used to drive a walking boot and pull that flat boat down there on the canal. And that was his job every day. He pulled that boat. Build those shelters, roof, grab the water bar, and all those places. Rock Fair up there in Rock. One of the pretty homes you see up there in Potomac. It was built on the strength and the sweat of black men. Black men wanted them quarries and cutting up stones so they could build them big fabulous houses that you had in Potomac. Through it all we live, so long we still stand. But as I was saying, we got seven last that still remains. Only 262 people. Once we lived on the road, and 59 homes that were there. And I have my only son, the only nine. She's still living, that's her heart. She's still holding on. But you know the place on the road called Talbot? Talbot was our refuge back in the day. Everybody basically on the road had some kind of affiliation with Talbot, working in Talbot, high school, school. Come back to Talbot. And I thought I was making some money back in I made 75 cents an hour. But even if they had one, can't do it today for $75. Well, I might have been there. We survived. We survived. We have plenty of love in that community for each other. Wasn't no locking of doors. I didn't know what locking the door was until I moved to D.C. And your house looked like a prison. But it put bars up to the all your windows, bar your doors, and that. Still here, God willing, I will be here next year as my contributor to what we're trying to do and hope eventually that the county will look and give us some justice so we can win this battle. And Mark Elvis is there running again. We show Mark love, Mark didn't show us love in return. Mark, Mark made us a whole lot of promises what he's going to do. He got elected in the last election. He used it our church as a springboard for his election. It wasn't for the blacks that gathered around the black churches that we had in Montgomery County. Our government would not be waiting at the day. But I stand here as one. It's not a clear to stand forward. But I'm going to hope that he doesn't go back to office again. Because he hasn't done nothing for the black community. White community, deaf privileged people, people don't have no income, and then they bid out of their places and things and whatnot. Because, and that's not his administration. And do I think he deserves another chance in, in office? No. Definitely not. I hope he never do not on my watch. And I thank you all very much for your time and attention.
I want to thank everyone for coming in. I really want to thank all of our speakers today. Um, you know, there's all this talk about critical race theory. This is what this is. Right? This is it. Right? It's the unearthing of the truth. Brother Harvey, Harvey Matthews talks about white folks' clan that came through beating. So you could say, uh, just the clan. No, it wasn't just the clan. Government officials in Montgomery County facilitated this destruction of this community. The county council did then. The county uh, executive of the county did then. The planning commission, the Montgomery County Planning Commission, was set up in 1927 by a racist segregationist, and it was set up to enforce covenants to, uh, to make sure that black folks did not go where white folks were. That's how it was set up. It was set up that way, right? The Federal Housing Administration, under Roosevelt, was set up and it enforced exclusions of black people from white areas. It did it on purpose. It was a part of their policy. This is, so all of the history that you hear here is a part of that examination, which is critical race theory. You just don't say it's somebody who's acting badly. No, it is a society problem, it is a governmental problem, it is a history problem, and you've heard some of that and how the people here have gone about unearthing the truth. So, this is, the museum's closing in a bit, but before it closes, we really want to encourage you and invite you to come on upstairs with us to take a look at the exhibit. So thank you for coming. Thank you.